Craig slide? Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so if we can get going on this. Um, I just, this is the summary slide, so just to get us back in, this was the summary slide that I didn't go through yesterday about uh, at the end of the influenza viruses. So if you remember, um, both of these are called myxoviruses, both are infected by the respiratory tract, both um, have these neuraminidases, uh, <coughs> or at least some members of both uh, have them. So just to review some of the differences between the paramyxoviruses, which if you remember, include things like human paroinfluenza virus, measles virus, mumps virus, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, and the true influenza viruses, which include influenza A, influenza B, and influenza C. Um, the genome in the paramyxovirus is non-segmented, in the flu viruses is segmented. And we'll see whenever we have the lecture that should have been tomorrow, um, that makes a really important difference to flu epidemiology. Um, RNA synthesis in paramyxovirus is cytoplasmic. Uh, also myxoviruses, the true influenza viruses are exceptional in that it's in the nucleus. Um, they, neither of the, the paramyxoviruses do not need an RNA primer for their message synthesis, whereas also myxoviruses do, and the reason they're using that RNA primer, if you remember, is it's the end of host cell messages that they use as primers, and they use it in order to grab a methylated cap group rather than make it themselves. Uh, and then the, in terms of the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, paramyxoviruses, if they have both functions, um, have it as part of the same protein, whereas also myxoviruses uh, have both functions, but it's on different proteins. And in terms of syncytial formation, the paramyxovirus fusion protein functions at physiological pH, so they cause syncytia, whereas the orthomyxovirus um, hemagglutinin, which also functions in this case as a fusion protein, needs an acid pH. So it doesn't become finally active until it gets into the next cell. So when it's released from the one cell, it has to be cleaved in order to have the ability to become active, but it's not actually activated until it gets into an acid environment. So are there any questions about flu or paramyxoviruses before I go on to Rio? This is the last family I want to talk about. Um, Rio viruses are non envelope viruses. Um, they include rotaviruses, which you'll be hearing about um, from Dr. Narayan, uh, which are a major cause of infantile diarrhea. They're particularly serious in small infants. Uh, they also include one virus you'll be hearing about from me uh, called Colorado tick virus. Uh, so the Rio virus family has a double capsid structure, rather elaborate capsid structure. Um, these are transmitted fecal, fecal orally, um, and they have this very tough capsid structure. I guess they've got a rather tough life ahead of them. Uh, not one we would want. Um, and they have a segmented, double-stranded RNA genome in them. So the capsid structure, as I say, is a sort of double-walled structure. There's an inner capsid and an outer capsid. Of course, since they're icosahedral virus, they have 12 pentons. And the 12 pentons have a rather elaborate structure, which I've shown here, and we'll come to talk about those later on. Uh, and they have um, segments, and it's usually 10, although some members may have a different number. Okay, so what happens? They get into the cell, and we'll go into that in a little bit of detail in a minute. But what happens when they get into the cell? As I said yesterday, they've got double-stranded RNA. Well, I didn't say they had, but they have double-stranded RNA. And as I said yesterday, our ribosomes, they're not exactly strong then, and they can't unravel this double-stranded RNA to get at the message. So this has to, the message has to be made as a single-strand message, positive sense message. So there's a, you need a polymerase to copy this. We don't provide the right polymerase for, for copying double-strand RNA into single-strand RNA. Um, our polymerases never see double-stranded RNA to any significant extent. Uh, so this enzyme has to be coded for by the virus. As we've already said, these RNA viruses all code for their own polymerase. And in this case, of course, it's a double-strand dependent RNA polymerase. 
Uh, and it has to be packaged into the virion because you can't make any message until you've got that polymerase around, so you have to take it in with you. So the RNA polymerase is packaged in the virion, and so are the capping and methylating enzymes. Um, I said about flu grabbing the host cell um, ends of host cell messages. Other virus families, including cytoplasmic virus families, do the same thing as flu and grab host cell cap. Uh, but this one doesn't. It makes its own. So it takes in the enzymes for doing this. And as we saw with flu, if you're going to need an endonuclease and everything, um, you really wonder how, what's the savings are of going the one route rather than the other. Okay, so it make, takes its own enzymes in. So again, these would be potential targets if we wanted to make antivirals. And the problem is we'd love to make antivirals to all of these things, but in terms of the pharmaceutical industry and their profits, some of these are not terribly cost-effective. Uh, the first line of defense is usually to try and make a vaccine. Okay, so we said there's a double-stranded RNA genome, an outer capsid and an inner capsid, and the RNA polymerase and the modification enzymes are packaged inside this nuclear capsid so that when it gets into the cell, all these things are re there and ready to go to make the messages so it can start on its life cycle. Uh, I said they're called the, the, one of the genus, genera inside the Rio virus family is the rotavirus genus. And I said that that uh, is important and I was just going to show you this. And again, I'm not sure, I don't particularly want to dim the lights because you could probably look at this on your computers or in the... Uh, in the handout, I think. I can't remember. It's in the handout now. Um, but anyway, the rotaviruses are so called because they're called after wheels, and that's because if you look at the edge of these, um, they look rather like a wheel. Same thing as a rotary club label, uh, lapel pin. <coughs> so that was just to show you what these viruses can look like. And again, they don't look as angular when you look at them properly because they've got these sort of swollen nuclear capsids rather than the really angular sort, but they're still icosahedral. Okay, so it includes Rio, Rota, and I mentioned the Orbi viruses, which include Colorado tick virus. Okay, so what, and again, I'm not going to ask you about the medical connections uh, if on these particular lectures, but the questions on clinical aspects will come from the clinical lecture. I'm just introducing the viruses so you know where you are. So what about absorption, penetration, and uncoating? Um, these bind to the outside of the cells. They're taken in by the um, oral route. They get down into your gut, uh, and they bind to receptors on the cell surface. And then there's a little bit of confusion because it's rather difficult to do experiments in people's gut to see what happens. Uh, but it's Either they go across the plasma membrane or they're taken up by endocytosis or maybe a bit of both. We're not entirely clear. Let's see what's on the next. Sorry. Okay. Let me just go back. And when they're in the gut, their outer coat is digested um, by our proteases once they get down into the small intestine. Uh, and our proteases take off a lot of that outer shell. And in doing so, they release the, some of the constraints on the structures of those pentons. You remember I said those pentons had this rather elaborate structure. And the result is that they kind of pop out. They sort of flower. In fact, one of the people who originally saw this said they, they sort of look like tulips opening up at the penton, at the 12 vertices. And these are what actually forms the receptors uh, uh, the attachment protein. So the attachment protein is somewhat buried here, and then it's released as this capsid is partially digested. So it relies on the protease in the GI tract to remove that really tough part of the tough outer shell so that these uh, attachment proteins are released and able to activate. Uh, the attachment proteins, proteins are at the vertices. That's what we frequently see with these icosahedral viruses. And they cross the membrane directly or via endosomes. We don't know which. But somehow they get across the membrane, and we don't know how they do that. Um, because what you find is you have this parental virion, um, which has got all this tough outer shell. That, as we said, is digested. Uh, and then a virus particle gets into the cytoplasm, which has lost a lot of these outer proteins. And it's lost so much, in fact, that those pentons, which were originally highly protective, 
have now all got a hole through them because the contents have come out and ploughed out or gone away. And so the pentons now have a hole through them, and they're sometimes called chimneys at this stage. Uh, and so what can happen now is this has actually got a chimney at each uh, vertices, and the nucleotides can get in down the chimney just like your Christmas presents do, uh, and help this polymerase to go off and make its RNA. So it, the chimneys are too small for the, the double-strand nucleic acid to get out, uh, but they're, or the enzymes, they're kept inside. Uh, but the, uh, nucleo the new nucleotides for assembling the new messages and the precursors for the methyl groups uh, can, for capping can all get inside. Uh, and so what you can do is you make the RNA in this nice little protected environment. And we'll see when we come to the flu lecture later on this morning, there's a good reason for keeping double-stranded RNA under wraps because it causes a antiviral reaction. It's a very potent inducer of antiviral reactions. So if you keep it under wraps, the stupid old nucleus doesn't know that you've got double-stranded RNA in this capsid. So the messenger RNA can get out through the chimneys. Um, Single-strand RNA is very flexible. It can get out. Uh, and the messenger RNA, it can be translated into proteins. Uh, which occurs, and these proteins can then assemble around messenger RNAs, and how you get the right ones in is still a question of um, considerable investigation. Uh, so what you get then is these, uh, these proteins that are made from these messages assemble a rather flimsy capsid structure uh, with the messenger RNAs inside them. So of course, once they're encapsidated, um, they no longer can be translated by the ribosomes, uh, but you're making plenty of this stuff, so there's plenty more coming out of this particle to make more messages. Um, and then what happens here in this early replicase particle is gradually more proteins are made and the capsid becomes a little bit uh, more thicker, and, uh, more substantial. Uh, and what you get is what's called a late replicase particle, and the reason these are called replicase particles is because the process of making mRNA is known as transcription, and it's done by the same polymerase makes the messenger RNA as is going to make the genomic RNA here. Uh, but here, the replication does, occurs in the new particles, and what happens is it's kind of a rather late event, and it's almost like the virus suddenly says, hey, you know, I've got this capsid structure, I've got this single strand message sense RNA in, but I'm supposed to be a double strand RNA virus, I'd better quickly replicate. And so it copies the other strand, the negative strand, makes a double strand RNA uh, at this stage. And the same enzyme that transcribed here uh, replicates here. It's just, as I say, it's all the same RNA polymerase. It's just referring to whether it's making genome or message. Uh, and the morphogenesis is then completed, and it's a rather elaborate morphogenesis in the case of um, rheoviruses, uh, rotaviruses, because for some reason they bud into your endoplasmic reticulum, so you'd think you were going to get an envelope virus, but then they bud out again, lose the membrane again, and go back through the cytoplasm. We have no idea why. So it's a rather elaborate little morphogenesis step. And the progeny viruses are released by cell lysis. So again, and as I said, with a lot of these viruses, a rather simple cell cycle. Um, this whole thing about doing things inside capsids looks a rather sort of elaborate idea, uh, but there's again a sort of logic behind it because, as I say, double-strand RNA would cause the cells to become strongly antiviral. No, the nucleus is irrelevant to the whole cycle. Okay. So, as I say, during release, they're transitly enveloped. We don't know why. Um, but, again, if we understood why, it would be a potential target. And as time goes on, a lot of these targets are getting uh, worked on and, and will eventually. Oh, well, that is the end of that show anyway. So are there any questions on Rio 